from the community housing project a lot of seniors component and with the idea that this could be almost a mixing place uh, for those this park will be uh, opening soon it's designed not only to be fun in the daytime but well lit at night with a kind of artistic uh, lighting program and uh, we'll be opening the first two uh, blocks of it uh, sometime this summer and the last block uh, will be opening in July. This is an aerial view of Don River Park which if you come down uh, Bayview Extension you now bump around and you can get a little glimpse into as you're driving by. We've been working on this for several years. Below the park is the flood protection landform, which is flood protection for all of downtown, uh, from the Don River all the way to Bay Street, as a matter of fact. So not too far from where we're standing. This berm will prevent any flood in a hurricane, hazel type uh, storm situation. And on top of the berm, we've built a fantastic park, uh, also by Michael Van Valkenburg Associates. Uh, most of the uh, park landscape is installed, however there's two sides to every berm and there's a dry side which has the park and there's a wet side which has yet to have its armored smoke put onto it and until that's done we can't open the park. So it will be tantalizingly there this summer and not open but it's actually a good thing. Uh, we have planted uh, tens of thousands of plants literally in this park and they need some time to grow and establish themselves. So by next summer this will be a very lush green place. We've actually recreated a marsh, like the type of marsh habitat that would have been down here when the Don River used to wind its way through. We're moving now to East Bayfront, George Brown College. Uh, their waterfront campus is, is well underway, uh, due to open in the fall with uh, students coming down here. Uh, waterfront Toronto has uh, worked with them on, the, on that project. We are also responsible for all of the public realm around it, so Sugar Beach, Sherburn Common, the Water's Edge Promenade, as well as all the local streets. And here you see a photo of some of the local utility work that we're doing that will service George Brown College. If you've driven on Queen's Key, you've seen the external sanitary sewer uh, is under construction. That's to serve all of the East Bayfront, so it will serve uh, the, the Bayside project as well as the Keyside projects when they come along. In addition, we have another development poised to get started. It's called Mold Development by Great Gulf. The design of the building is by Moshe Safty. It is uh, it be Moshe Safety's first residential building in Toronto, and it's right on the east side of Sherburne Common, and it will be one of the first buildings it and George Brown will start to really frame that space, which is the architectural conception of the, of the parkscape. And as I mentioned, the Heinz development, which is also on the east side of Sherburne Common, but on the south side of Queen's Key, is the whole parcel that goes from Sherburne to Parliament. Uh, that they are in design now on the first two buildings, two residential buildings, which will also line the park and will contain a winter garden connecting through. Uh, the design is still very much in development, but this is an early rendering of what it uh, is starting to look like. We're demolishing the Can Park building. If you've driven by, there used to be a very large warehouse. It's coming down. And in the Portlands, which was in the media quite a bit a few months back, and, and again recently, we are working with the city on an acceleration initiative. We're still in the process of doing that. I think we had originally intended to be bringing some recommendations forward in June. That's now been put off until uh, the fall. So we will continue to work, and that's really to help us develop in more detail, uh, in particular, the sort of business financing plan for the project. And we are also trying to come up with a plan for the whole port lands that goes beyond the original Lower Donlands plan. So we have one comprehensive frame for the whole, whole area. Uh, another project that most people don't realize we're uh, involved in is the Union Station uh, second platform. And that's all being funded through Waterfront Toronto. And uh, that work is uh, proceeding underway. And we hope it will be done uh, on schedule. I've got a slide here just to remind people that in addition to the work that we do and our developers do, we have a design review panel that consists of uh, about a dozen of Canada's leading architects, landscape architects, and designers. They review every project that we do and every project that private developers are doing uh, on the waterfront area and uh, are really trying to raise the bar for design excellence uh, in the city and on the waterfront in particular. Uh, another program that we've started since I think our last public meeting, we have our Waterfront Toronto Employment Initiative, so we're trying to link up people who are underemployed or unemployed with some of the work that's going on and some of the training that's going on on the waterfront. That was my quick run through of things that don't have to do directly with Central Waterfront. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to, to take them on these topics. All right, Noah. 
Well, that's a fine question, and I don't remember. See, I don't do that correctly, so I can't remember the details. Let me see if I have that in my notes. Oh, sorry, the question was, when is the Union Station project due to be completed? And I'm not sure I actually have the answer to that question right here. I do not have the answer to that question here. We'll have to get back to you with that. I imagine that information can be divined somewhere through our... Okay, there you go. 2014 or 2015, thank you. Yes. Uh, so there'll be seating on the inside, 
very soft grasses that the winds off the lake would animate, and then these sort of light canopy enclosure where the, the light and air, uh, so it's not this heavy uh, uh, presence. That's something where you always have a sense of the water and the qualities of light and air there. Ontario Square, um, facing onto Queen's Quay, um, we heard from you at the last public meeting a long time ago about wanting more green, and I think we're really delivering it here. Uh, we're creating a, a held space just off of Queen's Key, and that is um, the result of thinking of using planting to hold spaces for events, for passing through, desire uh, lines of movement from this building across to future spaces uh, uh, in the development or to the cultural village. Um, what you see here in the foreground is uh, what you now see outside, which is the garage entry. That's where cars will stop. Everything else is going to be pedestrian priority. Um, and so you're going to be welcomed by this large stand of trees. Um, it's a, an explicit reference, uh, thus the name Ontario Square, to the Boreal Forest. And we're making this, conceiving of this as a urban stand of quaking aspen, the beautiful trees that uh, sort of very animated when the wind blows through and blows through them and creates a, a, a great little chattering sound. Um, and there's these things grow as great stands throughout the boreal forest uh, in Ontario. Um, this is, we're also using a whole set of uh, ground plane plantings, again references to native grasses that uh, will survive well in, in this condition. So here's a view uh, that would be roughly from uh, cross after leaving uh, the, the future light rail stop, coming into uh, the central space of Ontario Square, that's actually a, a view on the back of the hood where the cars are coming in from the other side. So all of that is going to be planted up with this light brocade of, uh, uh, of in the small trees. So to explain, yeah, two times a day uh, for 20 minutes or so, all the buses that normally are along Queen's Key Boulevard will be pulled into the site and managed by Harborfront Center, delivering uh, kids and uh, people to various programs that Harborfront Center offers, and then pulled out. This is not a circulation plan for cars on the site other than that, and some servicing vehicles. The uh, main entry for the garage is really open to the public and will be opening soon uh, to start getting people used to this. And also, where you come out of the garage is of central importance to this plan. In making an efficient garage, we actually found the opportunity of a uh, sort of a, a small void in the uh, garage, which you can see here as, you know, during a construction shot. And the idea we come to the truck to always saying that your experience of harbor front should start when you open the door of your car and you start entering it. And so bringing natural sunlight through an aperture in the ground and doing something with that. Uh, is, is something that's already proven to be much more uh, a pleasant experience than for most underground garages, and we're going to be doing more with that. And I'll show you that in just a moment with an art installation. Um, we're using a graphic pavement in the plaza. Part of that is to aid this idea of, of queuing people for circulation, uh, light. Um, uh, that not really that bad. I'm sorry, you can't see the uh, contrast in the slide. Uh, but there's a mixture of pavements um, where the outer ring uh, is where the vehicle traffic will happen so it doesn't stain and it won't show the wear signs of that. It also tells people that's, that's where on occasion vehicles will go. And the light pavement is where people will be most frequented. So here's an image of what it might feel like on the inside of this held space. Um, you can see the bus entering that, that uh, in the background there. So you have a sense of people moving through the trees uh, and, and uh, all the animation of the Harborfront Center program around you. It is also a place where uh, events can be held uh, within it. And we've done many iterations and studies of how that can be configured within this space from little markets and performances and such. Um, and then it's also a setting for this piece of art I was just mentioning that connects the experience of the garage, the experience of the plaza, working with Jamie Carpenter, an uh, architect and artist in New York, um, where the central core elevator and stairs, all the lobbies are lined with this uh, curtain wall glass that has a wonderfully interesting reflective uh, glass painted with a mylar uh, in inlay 
And what that does is take the sunlight uh, south facing and sort of broadcast it onto the inside of the uh, garage. It creates an obvious place of where you go uh, during the day within the garage to come up into the Ontario Square and then on to your destination. But then it also um, will be lit at the floor of the garage and will reflect it like back up during the nighttime and become sort of this beacon uh, within the uh, Ontario Square space. The cultural landscape, the third space, this is, again will be the, the future um, footprint for the uh, development. Um, we're trying to build uh, a way of using this uh, for the Harbor Front Center seasonal tent programs, but um, we're also trying to define that with uh, hedge, uh, hedgerow planting in uh, metal bins, so it's a temporary thing that we can bring onto the site uh, and then pull off when it's time to, to do uh, change, start building buildings. Um, and we're relocating the information services pavilion that you may remember on being on the site before, being a key place where you can find out what's going on at uh, Harborfront Center. And we're doing something, or I should say Harborfront Center is doing something about uh, the fact that there are so many bikes in this city and being right next to the Martin Goodman Trail and so much of the visitorship can be accommodated by the bike, uh, that there will be a bike park that I think has some bike repair and some places to lock your bike, some facilities to uh, help those people. As I said, um, it's going to be uh, a place for the seasonal tent program uh, with a uh, sort of eco-turf design like you see on the uh, west side of Harbor Front Center. Um, and that was worked out well. Uh, here's a cross section through the, the edge of that space where those metal bins that hold sort of uh, sumac and hedgerows, plants that will survive, but also create these little shade banks along the edge, so you can uh, have some uh, respite from those hot weather days here. But then we also bring back the artist garden program and be able to line that on the inside of this space. Uh, new lighting and a new walk on the Queen Ski terminal side will again connect the waterfront to Queen Ski. So there will be a whole new set of these pathways now connecting Queen Ski and the waterfront. Just a quick rendition. We're thinking about painting these things silver. Uh, let's see. And then, so lastly, with the, uh, these three core spaces, where the construction schedule to get to the garage has been quite aggressive, and we're, we're there now. Um, the garage can open very shortly, as you can see. Um, we're going to push through to October to get the substantial lion's share of what you've seen done and built. But because a lot of the planting is what they call fall hazard, we have to wait till the spring to finish that out. But uh, it's going strong. Um, we're well on our way. I'd like to hear your comments. I don't know if that's afterward or now. exciting that for nine years we've been trying to bury the the uh, parking surface parking lot that it's at the center of our site believe it or not it was nine years ago this week that the government of Canada announced that they would help us to build the underground garage and put cars under so that we could build public spaces on the top so it shows you how long it takes to get things done but uh, we've also been very worried about where we would be able to get enough money to build the next square. Uh, the, the government gave us money to do Canada Square and the underground garage. So we're really pleased that the government of Ontario has come to the table and allowed us to get Ontario Square underway now, so that it will be open, uh, as, you know, by the spring of next year. And uh, next week we'll be opening the underground garage. So uh, it's been a fast pace after we got through the first eight years. So, uh, I guess we're doing the reverse of the Joni Mitchell song. So, uh, anyway, I'll tell her when I can answer any questions. How are you going to keep people from getting hit by the buses? 
And how can you have smelly, noisy buses going around a park? Uh, this is something that the community's been uh, wanting to have solved for a long time, the buses lining the entire street. So that was one of the prerequisites of the design of the whole area, is the first thing was that it had to accommodate the school buses and camps buses that come to Harbor Front Center. We have upwards of 10 or more at a time. So the, that's why it's been designed so that the buses go around the periphery of the, of the uh, square. And the square is safe for pedestrians and also for unloading uh, children. And it's literally for 20 minutes a day, Monday to Friday. So it's the lowest use for the public, but it's the highest use for kids. So I think we've come up with a really good solution of the, the uh, buses circling the square and also not uh, getting in the way of pedestrians. And again, it will be for 20 minutes from about quarter to nine in the morning, Monday to Friday, till about 10 after nine, and then at 3.30 or four in the afternoon. And other than that, there won't be a use of, uh, that buses won't be coming around there or, or any other kind of vehicle. So I think it's a really good solution to also get off the street and uh, get rid of the congestion on the street. It's just that we get noise from the first buses coming all the time. At night, yeah, all the time. Do you think it's for school buses? This is, for, this is school buses. That's what Har that's all that Harbor Front Center is responsible for. So we generate the school buses. So we're, we're solving the school buses. So if there's other issues, you should maybe address that to the city. There's one here. Go ahead. What about all the other buses that are presently lining Queen's Key uh, on the weekends for sure and even after that? Um, I'm actually going to cover off a lot of that in the next presentation on Queen's Key. So if there's any more questions just on your key, uh, we've got uh, Bill and Bill over here, and then I'm going to give a presentation. And I, if I don't answer those questions, I'll be up here to answer them when I'm finished. So will the garage accommodate? 300. Any other questions? My question is on the Buffalo Village. Uh, we, why is it necessary to put any more buildings in that area? I mean, you know, we, we have the big entrance one day. Yeah, it may, and it's, are, it's in, build, just a minute, I'm finished. If you are going to build new buildings there, how tall are these buildings going to be? The original plan, and we presented it to the Stakeholders Advisory Committee and to another public meeting, was that uh, that area would have two and three story buildings that would accommodate some restaurants and, and small retail on the main floor and then our architects and artists studios on the second and third floor. That was a very original proposal which was actually enthusiastically received by the neighborhood who, were, who said to us that we, we really want Harbor Front Center to help us create a more of a neighborhood feel, places to go, etc. year round. So, but that's off in the future and that they, it's, it's literally just a, a very rudimentary scheme at the moment, so there'll be lots of time to discuss that in the future. We're not pursuing that right at the moment, so there'll be lots of time to discuss that before any f further steps are taken on. Yeah, but you do have temporary movable uh, landscaping going on there. So that's not too far I can tell you it's not because we don't have any money to do it, so. Uh, yeah, it looks wonderful and green. Congratulations. I have two uh, concrete questions. One is about the vertical walls of the buildings, the garage. Uh, can that possibly be covered, be, have, have color or some plants so instead of just gray concrete? And the same uh, applies to the benches. You know, in H2O Park, we have uh, concrete or, or stone benches, and nobody sits on them because they're so uncomfortable, and cold or hot or whatever. Um, okay, uh, definitely the benches are, are have wood elements so that they are not. Uh, yes. Uh, I think I think we we are looking at, at more contour. I understand that a, a flat pan seat is not comfortable, but. 
we have a lot of experience building these friendships, and we will make these comfortable. Um, your, your, your second question was sorry, benches and the walls. Oh, well, Bill, Bill has already talked about looking at uh, uh, an idea of a program for art on some of the walls, specifically that sort of the forehead space over the garage entry that you see when you leave the building is a, a site that we're exploring now, and I think that will be a really great uh, way to start dealing with that. Um, the, the nature of, and then Jamie's piece will be sort of covering up some of that concrete, the, the glass sheets. Um, I think in the end, uh, the effect of concrete is pretty uh, minimal and mitigated. We do need that to protect the planting, though. Are there any plans to change the building that we're in right now? Uh, the only thing that we're thinking about, but it would be probably two years off, is to reposition the entrance to this building. Right now, as you notice coming in tonight, the main entrance is to the uh, east side. And uh, it's, it's not going to work when the beautiful Queen's Key is redone. So our preliminary thoughts, we were going to do this earlier, but we're going to wait till Chris finishes the street, is, is uh, that we will reposition this, this central entrance right like out here, so you'll enter Queen's Key, uh, off of Queen's Key directly, and probably decommission that current entrance. It's too close to the garage, but we decided we'd wait till the street was done. Time for one more question. Oh, I'm sorry, we'll take your question and then. Okay, uh, we saw that 17 million tourists comes every year. Can you give us some brief? Um, break down what months usually tourist comes. When you had 17 million tourists attending our front, we would like to know how do they come. Like summertime, I don't think 17 million deal by 360 days, whether you're looking at 50,000, 50,000, I think so, something like that, a day or, or a day in Queen's Street. I don't even see 50, uh, 500 a day. Where did you get that figure from? I'd like to know. That's been done actually by Ecos Research that has conducted surveys over many years at Harborfront Center. They, and they just finished conducting an extensive survey both on the site and off the site, etc. And they can actually ab absolutely guarantee that that is the, as close as we can get to measuring what the traffic is on the entire site. So we're talking about the whole 10 acre site of Harborfront Center. And they've got a very scientific methodology of doing it. And uh, you know, you're more than welcome to talk to them about that. Sorry. This will be our last question. And then if there's time at the end of our Queen's Key presentation, we'll, we'll take a few more. You have done a great job of putting trees. And I want to tell you something else about those trees. You should plant all those trees and those trees should be flowering cherries. And cherry tree will survive here. If you take Reese Street going to the Rother Center, there are few trees that flower during March. So when you have all these trees of the same kind, in March you will have big atmosphere. And for these kind of thing, a lot of tourists go to Japan in March and South Korea. That's the only thing I have to tell you. Think about it. Those trees will survive, and you have example already on resisting. Thank you. Just before we get into the details, I want to take a step back and remind everyone that, A, we're here really to talk about uh, the start of construction finally on Queen's Key and that really what this is about is transforming Queen's Key from the uh, rather un uninviting street that it is today into what will become a great and vibrant waterfront street. Really today it's much more about getting through it and getting it over with and getting to your destination. We want it to become uh, a place that everybody wants to be, the people who live here, the people who visit here and that ultimately is the purpose of this project. How we got here, we've been working on this since 2006. We did an international design competition that was conducted uh, with a lot of public stakeholder input uh, throughout the process. Actually, we brought stakeholders in to comment on the designs halfway through the design process. And uh, 
stakeholders and the public were actually uh, part of the jury process at the end that led to the selection of this winning proposal by West Dayton DTAH, which is what we have been working on since. And to give it a test run, we actually did a mock-up, full-scale model, if you will, uh, kind of, of the project uh, that summer called Key to the City, pilot project where we created a temporary Martin Goodman Trail, we created a temporary landscape, uh, reconfigured the traffic, and uh, this was actually received very well. We got a lot of positive response for this uh, in opinion polls that we did randomly with people on the street. We surveyed about 1,000 people. Uh, about 75% said they would like to see this made permanent. And in fact, when we started taking it down, a lot of people asked us why we couldn't just leave it until we built the permanent condition. Uh, it wasn't really designed to last that long. But I think we learned a lot from doing this. And based on the feedback from that, we launched an environmental assessment to really look at all of the impacts on the environment from changing the traffic, from changing the patterns of movement through the streets. And that took about two years. Uh, as large environmental assessments tend to do. That was approved in April of 2010. And during that process, we held approximately uh, 50 uh, landowner meetings. Uh, we had three major public meetings, uh, several stakeholder committee meetings, um, and those public meetings involved anywhere from 250 to 500 people each. So there was uh, a huge amount of consultation, uh, well beyond the statutory requirement for a project that this uh, we really only had to do one public meeting. Um, we did three, and then we met with every single property owner on the street to try and address uh, their issues. And since that was approved, we've been working on the detailed design, and this is uh, also taking close to two years, largely because we are trying very hard to learn uh, from some of the past projects of this similar scale, like Bronson Vales, Bloor Street, St. Clair, uh, which ended up taking far longer than they were supposed to. And a big part of the reason for that is that as you start these projects, you discover that many of the utility companies who have pipes and conduit and other things underground decide that really while this is going on, they should upgrade their facilities. So what happened on Bloor was they kind of came one after another after another, and you had a long sequence of water pipes getting replaced, and then the street patched, and then the telcos coming in, tearing up the street, patching the street, and then the hydro guys coming in and doing the same. And so we've spent a lot of time working with all of the utility companies. They all know about this project. They have all been uh, designing their replacement facilities in conjunction with our design and engineering team. So there should be no surprises when we get into construction. I think everyone is essentially queued up now that when we start digging, they know what they're going to do and they're going to get out there. Um, and over the past six months, we've actually spent quite a bit of time on the pre-construction planning. We've selected Eastern Construction as a construction manager. Uh, some of those other roadway projects were not done with a construction manager, so they were independent uh, contractors uh, working at different times on the site. We will have a very coordinated site. Uh, we've got reps from the construction uh, management firm here tonight. They're the ones who built Sugar Beach and Sugar Common and the Water's Edge Promenade in East Bayfront for us. Uh, they're very familiar with uh, our work and our standards of quality as well as our commitment to community interaction. So we created a construction liaison committee, uh, which has already met several times, I think about half a dozen times, to review these uh, plans for staging the project. We're now on our 11th version of the staging of construction for Queens P. Uh, we've been listening to CLC comments, to the BIA, and we've tried to adjust to a, a large degree how we build, where we build, when we build, to meet some of the many needs on the street. So, for example, um, we were hoping to start our construction a little earlier in the summer. This coming summer, the BIA was very concerned about uh, the impact on jobs and businesses in the area, so we've postponed any work in the central area of the waterfront until after Labor Day, so after the peak season is over. We'll start at the far end with doing some work, uh, and then we won't get into the major stuff in the, in the heart of the waterfront until after uh, the peak summer season. This construction plan has about 11 sub-stages to it, but it's basically divided into three major stages that I'm going to go through for you in just a moment. Uh, before I do that, I'm just going to summarize the components of the design in case some of you are not that familiar with it, so when I talk about the construction, you'll understand what elements I'm referring to. 
So it's happening now. Actually, today, uh, Bell has started reconstruction on their conduit uh, under Queens Key. By the end of this month, Hydro will be starting on uh, building a brand new hydro duct. And then in August, we will start uh, uh, work on some of the TTC uh, rehab. Our design team, um, just so you know, uh, we've got West Dayton DTH. Uh, West Dayton is from Rotterdam. DTH is a homegrown uh, landscape architecture firm working with uh, Arab Engineering, who's got offices around the world. Uh, Hustle Structural Engineering, uh, BA Group, and if any of you have been on our committees, I'm sure you've met Alan Lloyd from BA Group, who's one of our best transportation guys in the city. Uh, and then uh, a whole slew of other consultants who've helped with many of the details. Um, and the construction team, as I mentioned, is Eastern Construction. Toronto Hydro has Powerline Plus, so when you see Powerline Plus signs out there, that's, uh, that's them. You may have seen LVM, there are geotech guys who are out there taking pouring samples. They've been doing that for a while. And Bell Canada has Acon. So you'll start to see these names popping up on signs on the street, which is why I'm going through it. So the five major design elements are the Southside Promenade, Martin Goodman Trail, TTC Streetcar Corridor, uh, the road, and the north sidewalk. So just quickly, the uh, Southside Promenade is really to create a 7.2 meter pedestrian promenade befitting the scale of this waterfront and its role as a main tourist destination. We now have sidewalks there that are about four feet wide in many places not appropriate for the kind of waterfront we want to have. And one of the main features of this will be the red granite and white granite mosaic uh, maple leaf pattern. Uh, the second thing that we're adding, one of the real drivers behind this project is <coughs> extending the Martin Goodman Trail finally through the central waterfront. For those of you who use it, you know it ends at about Spadina on the west, somewhere past uh, um, Sherburn on the east. We will be creating a completely dedicated, traffic-separated uh, Martin Goodman Trail that will be striped and designed exactly like the rest of the trail system, and will run all the way across, and will be lined with a double alley of trees that will shade not only the bicyclists, but also uh, the sidewalk once the trees grow to their full height. Uh, the streetcar uh, corridor, if you use it, you know it's in not in very good shape. They have a, a go slow order on it now because the rails are not in good shape. In fact, they just had to take it out of service a few weeks ago, doing enough emergency repairs to keep it going for a couple more months. We will be completely rebuilding it, so it will be brand new. We'll have the, uh, the sound, uh, sound attenuating rails, which are not there now, which will reduce some of the noise. We'll be widening all the platforms to uh, accessible standards, so there'll actually be space for the huge numbers of people that queue up there. Um, and we'll be providing other passenger amenities so that it really becomes kind of a, a marquee part of the, of the uh, streetcar system, not a, not a kind of leftover, which uh, it sort of has become. And that's largely just because it's at the end of its useful life. When these things are built, they have a lifespan of about 30 years, and I've yet to meet anyone who's been involved in this waterfront who says to me, oh, that hasn't been anything like 30 years, but it was actually done in the 80s, and it's coming up on its 30-year mark, so uh, time for it to be rebuilt. And we're lucky we're doing it in conjunction with the TTC, because they're spending capital dollars on it, uh, and we're uh, adding on to that project. So again, kind of joining things up that could otherwise be done uh, out of sequence and lead to more construction disruption. The roadway, as has been talked about a lot, we will be reconfiguring Queens Key as a two-lane roadway. Uh, one lane in each direction on the north side of the tracks. Um, I think people focus on that a lot from a traffic perspective. Uh, the real issue with the traffic um, has to do on Queens Key with the uh, lack of dedicated turn lanes. And so we are adding dedicated turn lanes so that every single intersection will have them. I sit in traffic on uh, Queens Key myself and I leave my building at 20 Bay Street because everyone is queued up to make a right turn to get up on the Gardner and I can't go straight through until they've all made their turn. They will now be dedicated left and right turns at that intersection so that if you're going straight, you'll still be able to go straight. You won't have to wait. The signalization is also an old signal timing system that uh, was based around uh, transit priority, which is a good thing, but it doesn't really function the way it used to. And with the new configuration of the street, you can get the streetcars and the cars to run parallel so that they'll actually be more green time for all of you in your cars as well as for the train. And on the north side sidewalk, which is where many of the uh, retail establishments are, um, we're going to be uh, completely rebuilding that sidewalk, also installing the red red pavers uh, to tie the whole street together. We'll be planting a consistent row of trees all the way along the north side as well. Uh, there are some trees there now, many of them not doing well, mostly planted according to a very outdated uh, detail for how to plant street trees. It never allows them to grow to their full potential. We'll be giving them about 
five times more soil volume than they've got now, so they'll actually turn into big mature trees. That's all the surface work. Then the other work, which is a big bulk of this project in many ways, is all of the underground utilities. So virtually every utility is going to be completely replaced and upgraded, uh, which benefits um, the future developments over in the East Bayfront, but also benefits all the people who are here, because all the quality of your own utilities will actually be uh, improved. Another thing that we've done is we're working in partnership with every single property owner along Queens Key to uh, make sure that that red granite pavement goes right up to the building face. If you've been to Bloor, you'll see in some places the granite goes right to the storefronts. In other places, there's a wide swath of old concrete left over from uh, before the project. Those are buildings who chose not to participate in the program. Uh, we have agreement in principle from every single property on Queens Key to participate in the program so that we will get that. If you look on this photograph uh, to the left, you'll see there's some street trees bordered by some cobblestone. That's the public sidewalk in this area. Everything else is private sidewalk, uh, belongs to the condominium, and has an access easement across it for the city. Uh, so if we just paved on the actual public sidewalk, we would have a little strip of granite. We would not have a granite sidewalk. Uh, so we're, we're happy that they are participating and that they're uh, putting funds toward this. I think it's a real great uh, example of how much enthusiasm there is for the project. Uh, doing the same on the south side of the street, where we're not just building the promenade, but where there are some existing buildings that are up close. It's the Radisson Hotel. We'll be fixing this condition, and it will look like that when we are finished, um, which will not only make the sidewalk uh, more even instead of a funny slope, but perceptually will make it much wider, because right now it's kind of divided in, in two. Another project that we're doing that's a late addition is an interim extension of the Martin Goodman Trail all the way from, uh, from Bay or, or Young, uh, that area, uh, to Parliament Street, actually, eventually, but uh, for, the, for the moment to Jarvis. And this is going to be done uh, this year, actually. And what you've got today is in this zone between the kind of main part of the central waterfront and the East Bay front that's under development, you have a, a big dead zone, although when MT27 is built, it won't be quite as dead. But right now, there's a minimal sidewalk and no, uh, no good bicycle facilities. So this will get a temporary treatment. We'll build a temporary Martin Goodman Trail uh, on part of the sidewalk. The sidewalks here are being widened as part of the development project. And we'll build some sidewalk next to the trail. And then we'll create an interim uh, buffer zone between the bikes and the cars, taking the old bike lane and using it for, uh, for, for planters uh, that will kind of point to the future landscape. Because the goal eventually is what we're building starting now in this part of the waterfront will eventually be built all the way to the other end. We can't build it over there yet, though, because there's a whole big transit project yet to happen. Um, but we don't think we can wait for that, uh, largely because this is an, an unsafe condition, actually, in, in several areas. This is in front of the Red Path uh, Sugar Factory. There is uh, not only no bike, bike off-street bike path, there's no sidewalk. So you try to walk there, you're either walking on gravel or you're walking in the street. So that too will get this treatment, and uh, by next spring, you'll be able to have a continuous bike ride um, basically from, uh, from Bay Street all the way to Jarvis. And then once the project we're starting now is done, uh, it'll be connected all the way back via the Martin Goodman Trail to the Coronation Park. So that was a quick summary on the design. That wasn't so quick. But what I really want to focus on is the actual construction. Uh, so the project boundaries of what we're doing right now, this first phase of the project, is uh, really from Yo-Yo Ma Lane or Spadina. No one really knows Yo-Yo Ma Lane unless they're down here, so we say Spadina, but it's actually Yo-Yo Ma Lane, uh, over to uh, Bay Street. And um, <clears throat> as I said already, we're doing more than just the surface. Um, so the TTC tracks are at the end of their service life and they'll be rebuilt. Uh, Toronto Hydro, actually the whole hydro system here is old and starting to crumble and is ready for a rebuild. So that project, um, they're going to be uh, greatly increasing the number of ducts they have, which means lots of room for expansion and more electrical capacity. Uh, Bell is actually adding uh, fiber optic cable uh, down here to, to more of the buildings. There's an old sanitary sewer line that if we don't fix it now would need to be replaced soon and we'd have to tear the street up. So we're going ahead and being proactive and doing that now. And same with the uh, storm, water, and uh, working. So every single utility essentially we're going to do. 
And as I said, these all were going to happen, but they would have happened over a sequence of five to eight years, and we're hoping to compress all of that into basically two and a half. So we'll save time. Uh, there's a moratorium after construction for five years that the city's quite good about enforcing now, so no one will be able to come in and rip anything up uh, once this is done. So everyone either needs to get in now or they need to forever hold their peace for five years. And it will save us money because we don't have to mobilize, demobilize, mobilize, and demobilize. So I just want to take you through an overlay of uh, all of the stages of the project. So uh, as I said, it's really divided into three main parts. Stage one is really rebuilding the utilities that are underground in the TTC. Uh, and then stage two is the north side of the street. Stage three is the south side. So uh, starting uh, this summer and for about a year, uh, we will do uh, the bell upgrades that I mentioned. It's largely new lateral connections and a few new tie-ins uh, for some of their main lines. And you can see where those are located. Doesn't look like very much yet, but just wait till I get to the end. Uh, then uh, Toronto Hydro's work is a brand new duct line, uh, whole length of the street. Um, that is also starting, as I said, in June. Will last for about uh, six months of construction time, but they will be building it in in 100 meter increments as they go. So they're not going to tear up the whole street where you see that green line at once. They'll tear up 100 meters, redo the duct work there, patch it up, move on, dig up another 100 meters. So it's not going to be one gigantic pit. Chris, I'm sorry, we're just adjusting. We had to adjust the color. It's um, oh. not reading properly. Oh, so we'll just that's so interesting. We'll just take it <laughs> so we're going to increase the contrast on Queen's key to 30. <laughs> Once the brightness gets to 17, uh, I think you're all going to feel lots happier and sunnier. It's a mood enhancement kind of thing. Uh, and the brightness boost is really good. You're going to like that a lot. Look, I'm not sure it's getting any better, Sam. All right, well, you can pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. We're also doing a bit of road work that is in sort of a weird muddy color that's supposed to be yellow. Uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, that is the beginnings of uh, reorienting some of the way buses will uh, drop off and pick up passengers for the island ferry terminal. Um, and we'll be doing that probably uh, at the end of this summer to start to accommodate some of the construction work that will start at that end of the, uh, the street. Municipal services, so this is your, the, uh, the water and the sewer and sanitary. Uh, that, as you can see, is more or less a complete rebuild as well uh, for most of the length of the project. Again, we're still in this period of the first year here. And then the TTC uh, will start uh, uh, running bus service in place of the streetcar on July 29th. And then in August, at the two ends of the streetcar line, we'll start tearing out the tracks and the concrete subbase really the concrete sub-base that's the problem. It's failing and cracked and settled. And then once the peak season is over, we'll start tearing it out in the middle. Uh, TTC crews will come out and take down the power lines. Uh, and then it all starts getting rebuilt. And again, that will happen in sections as well. So by the time all of that work is done, we will have basically demolished and rebuilt the TTC in right of way, We've gotten all the new utilities in, and the streetcar will be back up and running by the summer of 2013, so it'll be out of service for probably 10 months. During that time, we're going to run a loop bus uh, westbound on Queens Key, eastbound on Lakeshore, and it'll go up to Union Station. We'll more or less mimic what the streetcar does now. It'll go all the way out to Exhibition Place. Um, then in 2013, summer of 2013, the streetcar will come back so we don't have to run those buses. And then what we're going to start doing is work on the north side of the street to rebuild the actual street into its permanent configuration. So here will be the road work where we really change that north side. We create the two moving lanes, all the dedicated turn lanes, all the new signals. And at the same time, we'll be working on the sidewalks, doing those beautiful granite uh, paver sidewalks that I described, really from the summer of 2013 uh, through sort of spring of 2014. And during this time, even though we'll be rebuilding the road on the north side, the south side lanes will be open to cars. All of the sidewalks will be kept open uh, at all times. When we're actually rebuilding a sidewalk section, and they'll be built in fairly small sections, there'll be gangplanks put from the doorways of the buildings out to the part of the sidewalk that's not being rebuilt. So every storefront, every apartment building will have 
24 hour uninterrupted access to the building. Uh, we are going to make sure that we get in and out uh, at all times, uh, everywhere. Um, we will then have to take the streetcar out of service again uh, for a short period of time to rebuild the loop at Spadina. I think this is an issue that a lot of people have had some questions about. We're not actually changing the loop that's there. The loop that's there will be rebuilt almost identical to the loop that's there today. I think we're shifting it a couple of feet to help some of the uh, vehicular movements. Um, that will be about a six week project. So it'll come out of service again for about six weeks. Uh, again, somewhere probably hopefully before peak season in the summer of 2013. And then, uh, sorry, yeah, after the peak summer of 2013. For six weeks, we'll have buses again, and then the streetcar will be back up and running. But all the movements and stops and operations will be uh, essentially exactly the way they are now, except they're all going to be nice and new. Uh, there was some confusion between this, I think, and the Yo-Yo Ma Lane crossover, which simply has to do with transitioning the cars and the streetcars to the existing configuration that runs out to Bathurst. The loop does not go to Yo-Yo Ma Lane. The loop continues to be the same loop that it is. And then if you're driving west, after Spadina, you will cross over the TTC tracks. Or I guess you could say the TTC tracks will cross over you, depending on which direction the car is moving. And there'll be a signal for that that gives transit priority so that we don't have to actually switch you from south side to center in the middle of an intersection, which would not work. Um, so that, that'll be a six week disruption to service, which is a lot less than the, than the first one. Uh, it's critical for not only the Queen's Key service, but also the Spadina service uh, relies on this loop as well. So then we get to stage three, and actually I should say that at the end of this stage, so in the spring of 2014, the new road and the new north side sidewalk are finished. There's no more work going on, so the street will be now functioning the way it's permanently meant to function, and uh, if all of our calculations are correct, it's going to be functioning a lot better than it does today, and for the sake of driving, we don't really have any more disruption from this project going forward because the third stage is really to build everything on the south side of the tracks, which is the promenade and the bike trail. So the Martin Goodman Trail will get put in, and the pedestrian promenade will get put in. That will take uh, somewhere from, say, spring 2014 to around the end of 2014. Well, it seems like an easy project. There's actually quite a lot to it. We are putting in what are called soil cells. Uh, which is a uh, fairly advanced system for getting urban street trees to grow well. It's a kind of uh, plastic structural system that you put into the ground that prevents soil compaction, which is one of the main uh, limiters of street tree life in Toronto. They'll also have a continuous tree trench, so we have to build uh, some structure over it to hold up the sidewalks without compacting the tree roots. Uh, so those will all go in, and then the pavers, the granite pavers with the mosaic, I believe there's about 2.4 million stones have to go in. The stones are not big concrete slabs like they did on Bloor. They are much more like a, a cobble. It's a four inch by four inch by four inch cube of granite, virtually indestructible. Remember, we, Luigi tried to break one for us once uh, in the old Canbar building and the thing just could not be broken. We smashed it and threw it around. And it's how it works in Europe. When you see them doing street repair, they just take them out. They fix up the pipes and then they take the old stones and put them back in. That's what we'll be able to happen here. There'll be a uh, trained team on board to fix it going forward uh, after the work is done. But it takes a while to hand lay them. If you want to see what it looks like if you haven't been to the Water's Edge Promenade and East Bayfront, uh, east of the Chorus Building and, and the uh, Red Path Sugar Factory, you should go and walk it. It will look virtually the same. That's coming up on two years old now and it is still beautifully dead flat. Push a stroller over it, ride a bike on it, and it almost feels like you're on, uh, on, on asphalt. But it looks a lot nicer than asphalt. So I think part of the message I'm trying to deliver is that the street's going to be safe and functional all the time. Uh, access will be maintained to all the businesses and residences. Uh, there, uh, our messaging is going to be that the waterfront's open for business, whether it's coming down to Harborfront Center for events or shopping whatever. The BIA is working on a program to promote tourism down here during the construction season so people don't think this is just an area to avoid. Uh, and there will always be a vehicular transit and pedestrian uh, movement um, throughout. So just to describe a little bit what you might see, 
I've seen construction around the city already, which I'm sure you have. It seems to be almost everywhere. You can't really go about two blocks without running into a construction site. Um, so there'll be temporary fences around all of the construction areas. So when we're doing those 100 meter long trenches that I talked about, they'll be fenced off like this. The rest of the street will be open as normal. Uh, construction is uh, restricted by a bylaw to 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So there won't be uh, any uh, noise either before 7 a.m. after 7 p.m. from the street work. Uh, one exception to that is TTC who has the right to, to work 24 seven if they choose to, uh, depending on their schedule. So that may or may not uh, happen, but even if it does, it'll be for really just the track lane, which is a, probably a couple of weeks worth of work actually to literally put the track lane. So it's not, not per track for a period of time. Obviously there'll be some dust and debris. Um, there are really going to be no interruptions to any of those services other than, when this is brief, this is more like for about three seconds. So if there's a new power line being run into your building, there's a moment where it has to be switched over and that'll probably be done at two in the morning. And when you go from one line to the other, the power might go out for a few seconds and then come back up. Uh, but nobody's going to be without power for half a day or three days. Uh, it'll all be fairly seamless. And I already mentioned the TTC work. Um, so here you see some temporary hoarding that gets put up. It's called Fast Fence. It's, it's very transparent, but you can put banners and advertisements on it. So that's where we'll have the signage helping people find their way and uh, notifying people where stores are and their businesses are open. And basically the street will be a one-way street. Um, either on the north side or the south side, depending on which phase of construction we're in. I already talked about the transit loop, uh, mostly westbound on Queens Key, eastbound on Lakeshore, but there will be some points where it can run both ways on Queens Key. Uh, cyclists, uh, we get asked about this a lot. The main problem on Queens Key today from a cyclist point of view is there are no cycling facilities on Queens Key. So one of the primary goals of this project is to build those so we can't actually build temporary ones before we build the permanent ones. So, as today, cyclists will be allowed to bike on the street, but they'll have to use caution during construction. There is a portion of the old Martin Goodman Trail uh, that runs along Lakeshore that people can use. It doesn't go any farther east than York, unfortunately, which is part of why we're doing this project, but that will be there for people to take advantage of. So this is a series of maps that we're producing that will be widely distributed. Uh, we're still uh, refining them a little bit so that they're easy to read if you're not a transportation expert. But they will be uh, posted, made available, so that you can tell what the traffic setup is going to be at any given time. We're hoping for the most part to have three traffic setups, one for each stage of construction, so there's a fair amount of certainty and predictability. It's not changing every single day, going to this side to that side. We're going to try and do it all in one configuration for a year, another configuration for a year, and a final configuration for the last six months. So in uh, stage one, we're going to stop another turning movement the other half of the day, uh, but it should not be uh, for much longer than that. Um, so that was in the first stage, which is the first year. The second stage, uh, the traffic will be um, partly down to just one lane westbound for part of the time with certain segments, moving segments, uh, opening up the second lane. Uh, and so that will be for about uh, uh, nine months, but again, this should hopefully miss the worst of the summer season. And as we can open up lanes, we will. They won't will, will be completely down to one lane throughout the entire length for the whole time. Uh, but at points, it will be uh, closed down like that. And then uh, for the third phase, we will have the normal two-way traffic on the north side, streetcars back up and running in the middle, and we're just doing our work on the uh, south side of the street. And we're hoping to finish, planning to finish this by uh, the end of 2014. The one exception to that uh, may be the planting of street trees. Uh, street trees don't really like to get planted in the late fall, as Gulliver mentioned. And depending on when we're done with all of the work on the south side, if it's too late in the season, we're not going to plant them. We're going to wait until 2015 and plant them in the spring. It's another lesson from Bloor Street. They were in a real rush to say they finished it by the end of the year they were working on. It. They planted all the trees at the end of the year and almost all of them died and all of them got replanted. So we do not want to go uh, through that expense and, and waste of time. So that's something we'll have to see where we are as we get towards the end of construction. Uh, but other than that, there should be no activity really in 2015 and certainly we should be long done by the summer. So um, we're really hoping this is completely done, perfect, and ready for the world for the 2015 games. 
So there are lots of avenues for getting more information about this. The first one I want to mention is that we're having a, uh, an open house on Saturday at uh, 20 Bay Street. And we will have, I think I mentioned there were something like 11 different drawings of the construction phases. We will have those. They're 12 feet long each. We'll have them all up on easels. Uh, you can come and look at them. There will be staff from Waterfront Toronto, from all the consultant firms there to answer questions. If there's a specific issue about your building or access to a certain location, you can go to that drawing. You can find a person. You can ask them. Um, and then another thing that I keep reinforcing is that these staging plans are as good as they can be in the planning stage. Once we start doing the work, um, we will be listening and finding out what's working and what's not working. Eastern Construction has a full-time communications uh, manager whose sole job will be to interface with all of you folks out there. And if there's something that isn't working or you can't get into your building or your garbage truck is, is, is stuck on a construction bollard or whatever, uh, you'll be able to call him and they will come and help you. And if there are problems with how we've set up the routing in, in different areas, we will do everything we can to address them. So there'll be lots and lots of interaction like this throughout the whole process. We're not going to kind of show you these drawings tonight and see you in two and a half years when it's all done and hope it all went well. We'll be, we'll be there step of the way. Um, yeah, so there's the ad for the uh, open house. So it's 10 to 2. Uh, our website will be creating a uh, separate web page uh, just for uh, construction on Queen's Key. We'll be posting weekly updates about uh, any change in conditions, what work is expected to happen. So if you want to know when they're going to be jackhammering out the PTC right away in your block, that information should be posted there. Um, we're going to have live webcams. We'll also be uh, integrating this with the city's own uh, construction uh, street closure or street construction uh, website and uh, I think most of you know Waterfront Toronto over there too so you, you all know me and you probably all have my phone number so if any problems you know uh, I, I, will, I will do everything I can to make this work I think this project is going to be one of the best things to happen in Toronto in a long time I think it's going to make this street one of the most ten, ten most beautiful streets in the world I think I was quoted in the paper the other day saying when you go to Barcelona, you go to the Ramblas, when you go to Paris, you go to the Champs Elysees, you want Queen's Key to be, when you come to Toronto, that's the street you go to. I think we have a design that uh, has the ability to deliver that. Uh, West State and ETH are, uh, have produced some of the best work done in the, in the world in modern urban landscapes. And I think when the street's done, everyone's going to say, wow, I can't believe it ever wasn't like this. And hopefully they'll say it was worth all the noise in the dust. <laughs> summer season will be the only one where there will be heavy duty construction going on at all uh, in, the, in the main areas. Uh, hopefully by the following summer it's really kind of wrapping up the promenade on the south side. So it should just be one summer of real full-on construction on the street. Um, I know even that is not, not a great deal if uh, your summer is your only, your only period to earn your income, but as I say we're going to be doing everything we can. Working with the BIA to promote the street, working with our contractors to keep Access as uh, as good as it can be. I have a question to do. Of, uh, uh, actually, having some kind of physical barrier to the salt to have a lot of soil volume. So when the salt gets uh, dissolved into the water, the water runs up into the tree pits. That's usually how it gets in. And if you have a decent amount of uh, soil volume, then it's very diluted. So it's not damaging the tree. When you have very little soil volume, then you get very high concentrates of salt. That's when it's doing the kind of damage that you see. So the primary thing which Chris was talking about with the soil cell system is to get a huge volume of uh, soil for each of these trees so that they can withstand the salt and, uh, and grow really big. It was two questions at once. Yeah. Yeah. 
other question was about the fact that there was to have been a grass meridian. Oh, right, the grass meridian. Yes, we actually really wanted to do that, and in fact, uh, the PTC was supportive of our effort to try and do that. The, uh, the real challenge is that the TTC median is also an alternative route for emergency services. So if Queen's Key has traffic on it, fire trucks, when they're called to a scene, use the TTC median. EMS, if someone's had an accident, uh, they use the median as well. And you really can't drive big vehicles uh, or high-speed um, emergency uh, vans on grass safely. So it was actually a safety consideration at the end of the day. Well, we've debated on that, and I think we're going to pour nice quality concrete and try and put a nice finish on it. Uh, the problem is if you do anything more fancy than that, that that requires a special form or whatever, as soon as any piece of it gets torn up and replaced, it's virtually impossible to recreate it. I mean, we had thought about doing some nice patterns, but it won't take long before that looks I think the design team thought it would actually look worse to have a patchwork of some nice concrete and then some patches and just let it all be simple concrete. Uh, it's going to be surrounded by so many other things that are beautiful. So we will be separated by a row, uh, actually four rows of, uh, actually I can say cobble now, because this row will be cobble. This is where we want a textural kind of difference, so that um, if you were to ride close to it or walk close to it or use a cane, but you know there's a division there. Um, so this will also actually function as a drainage line. So the water as it sheets off, the Martin Government Trail will roll into this, but then it will give us um, what I call a subtle separation because, of course, we don't want to have fences or barriers in the streets, um, but we want people to understand um, where they should be cycling and um, ideally where they should be walking. Does that answer? Yeah? Sherburn and Spadina. Well, this project will be building the bike trail from Spadina to Bay. So that piece is, is what, that's what I just was presenting. So in the, in the next two and a half years, all the improvements to Queens Key will include a, a new uh, fully off street uh, Mark Goodman Trail all the way from Spadina to Bay Street. And then we have an interim project that we'll be doing at the same time to extend that from Bay Street uh, to Sherburn Jar and, and ultimately to Jarvis. Uh, we may be able to get it all the way to Jarvis in one shot. Yeah. 